few years ago, I sat down in a counselor's office, and as we were working through places where I'd become stuck in life, where there were these patterns I couldn't break out of, I remember one particular breakthrough moment that caught me by surprise. The counselor leaned forward, looked me square in the eyes, and asked, have you ever read the book called Boundaries? I said, yeah, I've read it maybe five or six times. I found it really helpful. That's amazing, he responded, because you haven't put a single thing from that book into practice. I laughed because I knew he was right. Sometimes we can read something, study something, even believe something deep in our bones, only to discover there's a huge gap between what we've heard or learned and the way in which we're actually living. And this isn't just true for books on healthy boundaries or maybe parenting or books on dieting, which I'm currently fasting from, but it's especially true when it comes to the Bible. We can spend hours reading and reflecting, meditating and memorizing and still find that if we're really honest, much like my counselor suggested, we haven't put what we've read into practice. One of the writers in the New Testament who challenges us and equips us to become faithful hearers and doers of everything Jesus taught is a man by the name of James. Now, if you've ever searched for the name James in the New Testament, you're gonna discover quite a few. It's kind of like playing Where's Waldo? You hunt, you think you found him, and before you know it, there's another one. So with all the Jameses in the Bible, it can get a little confusing who is being referenced when. In fact, not one, but two of the disciples were named James. And by the way, you can use that detail to totally crush it on Bible Trivia Night. But neither of those Jameses wrote the book of James. The author of James is actually Jesus' brother. Now, technically, Jesus didn't have any full-blooded siblings because of his divine nature. But in the scripture, Jesus' siblings are always referred to as his brothers and sisters. So I'm just going to call James Jesus' brother. Now, the reason James fascinates me is because he grew up with Jesus. He likely splashed in the same puddles with Jesus, played tug of war, and built with ancient Legos, also known as rocks. And so James was raised in the same household and knew of the miracles and teachings of his brother. And yet, James remained a skeptic. In fact, it wasn't until after the resurrection, when Jesus personally appeared to James, that he became a believer. On one hand, I love that because it shows that Jesus is always pursuing those of us who are skeptics and doubters. On the other hand, I'd love to ask James, why? Why weren't you convinced? Why didn't you believe? What was it about Jesus appearing to you after the resurrection that changed everything? The Bible doesn't give us a single detail about their interaction, yet something radically shifted for James. He moved from being a doubter to a believer, from a skeptic to a faithful follower, from a cynic to one of the most influential leaders of the Church of Jerusalem. We catch a glimpse of this radical transformation in the opening verse when he writes, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James could have claimed celebrity status as Jesus' sibling. Many of the apostles, including Paul, referred to James as Jesus' brother. But James identifies himself humbly as a bondservant, as one living in full submission and allegiance to Jesus. Even though Jesus' name is only explicitly mentioned twice in the entire book of James, scholars note that this letter sounds more like Jesus than any other in the New Testament, even those written by Paul. James constantly repeats the teachings of Jesus. If you take the Sermon on the Mount and overlay it with the book of James, you'll start to think that James was plagiarizing his brother in all the best ways. Let's take a minute to play a little game called Who Said It, James or Jesus? I feel like we need a little game show music here. 
I'm gonna read a passage from the Bible and you guess who said it, James or Jesus? Here's the first one. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. Who said it, James or Jesus? The answer is James. Let's try another one. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Who said it, James or Jesus? The answer is, again, James. Next one, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Who said it, James or Jesus? The answer is, Jesus. Last one, do not swear. Who said it, James or Jesus? The answer is James and Jesus. Take a look at just how similar these passages are. James 5, 12 says, above all my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. And in Matthew 5, 34 through 35, Jesus says, but I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool. When we're reading James, we must remember we're often reading the words of Jesus. It's almost as if James is just so filled up with the teachings of Jesus that they literally drip out of him as he writes. If you wanna see just how often James repeats the teachings of Jesus, flip to the back of your study book and you'll see a chart we've created. It is mind blowing. Now, continuing in verse one, we see who James is writing to. To the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Who are the 12 tribes? They're a collection of Jewish Christian congregations outside of Israel. Many of these Jewish believers fled Jerusalem just to stay alive. They faced persecution from both the Roman authorities who saw them as troublemakers and Jewish leaders who saw them as blasphemers. They wrestled with many of the same feelings we do today. Fear, uncertainty, loneliness, isolation, and anxiety about the future. James teaches them and us today that our response to adversity matters. First, James calls us to practice a defiant joy. Continuing in verse two. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Though the trials we face today differ from the ones that first century Jewish believers faced, James reminds us that no one escapes life unscathed. Notice he doesn't say, if you happen to face a trial, singular, but rather whenever you face trials, plural, of many kinds. Maybe you find yourself in a workplace where you're trying to do what's Christ-like and instead of being promoted, you're punished. Maybe the trials you face stem from an accident or a medical procedure gone wrong. Or you're exhausted and overwhelmed from caregiving for aging parents or an ailing spouse. Maybe you've been forced into foreclosure or bankruptcy, or you were handed divorce papers you never wanted to sign or lost the love of your life. Or maybe you're just fighting to stay sober. When it comes to adversity, we rarely get to choose the hardship we face, but we can choose our response. We can reach for ready-made reactions of cynicism or complaint, blame or bitterness, rage or resentment. Yet James challenges us to practice a defiant joy when he instructs, consider it pure joy. Such teaching would sound downright weird if it wasn't based on the life and the teachings of Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, blessed or happy are those who are poor in spirit, 
those who mourn. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us that it was for the joy set before him that Jesus endured the cross. Do you know what the source of that joy was? You. That through his death and resurrection, we can be with Jesus for all of eternity. So when James calls us to consider it pure joy, he is asking us to follow in the life and the way of Christ and practice a defiant joy. That word consider does not mean to feel a certain way. James is not calling us to an emotion, but to an action. The Greek word actually means to account or to take account, to think or to deem. Practicing a defiant joy is an active engagement of the mind in which we choose to place our trust in the character and competence of God. Practicing a defiant joy means that no matter what we're facing, we remain suspicious that God is up to something good. My husband Leif asked me, Margaret, you know that God is good, so why do you need to remain suspicious? Because I want to be a person who puts on night vision goggles and looks high and low above every branch, below every bush, in every nook, and every cranny for the goodness of God. Because when we look for the goodness of God, we will find Him. We can practice a defiant joy because we know that even when we can't see it, even when we don't feel it, God is still working for our good and His glory. Verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That word perseverance, or what's sometimes translated as endurance, can be understood as faith stretched out. Some time ago, I slipped on ice and I tore my labrum in my shoulder. And I had to go to physical therapy. And the therapist gave me this band with a list of exercises. He warned me, this is going to be hard. You're gonna be sore and tired and uncomfortable. But through this, you will grow stronger. And he was right. My shoulder grew stronger in ways it never had before. That's what James tells us to. Only he's not talking about physical muscles, he's talking about spiritual ones. We can consider it pure joy because we know that the tests and trials of life are the very means God uses to conform or rather cruciform Christ-likeness in us producing a whole, mature, genuine faith. That even when our capacity is diminished, God's is not. So you can practice a defiant joy because you know the very things that threaten to tear you down, God can use to build you up. That though the circumstances are loud, they do not have the final say. That though you may be sore, tired, and uncomfortable, God is making you mature and complete, not lacking anything. So when facing adversity, James calls us to practice a defiant joy. But that's not all he calls us to. Let's look at verse five. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. How incredible. God's wisdom illuminates the best possible way to live. James later identifies the signature qualities of God's wisdom. It's trademarked as pure and peaceable, gentle and merciful, reasonable and unwavering, and it produces good fruit, a harvest of righteousness. In the midst of adversity, the second call to action is ask God to lavish you with wisdom. If you're like me, sometimes God is the last source I go to. When something hard happens and I need to know what to do, I'll text and call my friends, read a zillion articles, watch videos from anyone who calls themselves an expert, and turn to every source other than God. I'll spend 10 hours whining and worrying when I haven't spent 10 minutes praying it's not that those people or sources can't be helpful or even used by God. 
But James says that when you're facing adversity or hardship, God awaits ready to lavish you with wisdom. God is not stingy. He doesn't scrimp or pinch pennies. God's got a whole vault of wisdom waiting for you. There's no hidden key. There's no secret code. Ask and it will be given to you. And get this, there's no judgment. God waits with open arms all day, every day, 24-7, 365 and a quarter to lavish you with wisdom. As you approach God, James says, remember this. Continuing in verse 6. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. One of my friends, Emma, shared quite vulnerably that this passage gave her anxiety. She thought it meant that if she asked for wisdom and had a molecule of doubt, then God wouldn't give her any wisdom and she'd be left to her own devices. I said, whoa, whoa, baby girl. James is not delivering a threat. He is giving you this rich, beautiful promise. He's saying, you're gonna encounter situations in life where you're not gonna know what to do. In those moments, go with the confidence that God will lavish you with wisdom. The God you're going to is so good that just a few breaths later in verse 17, James writes, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. James is saying, when you go to God for wisdom, remember who you're going to. Trust His goodness. Trust He's not going to shortchange you or withhold good things from you. God isn't asking you to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, try harder, or keep a stiff upper lip. God stands ready tippy-toe, ready to lavish you with wisdom. And it's His joy to give it to you. Our God gives generously to all without finding fault. When I shared that with Emma, she said, that changes everything. After that conversation, I thought, man alive, if God is that good, and he wants to give us that much wisdom, where in my life am I not asking him for it? The answer is most places. So I decided to take God at his word. I pulled out a piece of paper and I began writing down all the areas where I needed wisdom. Relationships, circumstances, situations. I started writing this list and it just, it kept flowing. What was shocking was not just how many areas of my life I'd never asked for God's wisdom, but how quickly God began providing wisdom. And those micro steps forward, those moments of clarity. So the list kept growing and keeps growing today. But we need to remember that asking God to lavish us with wisdom, it's not a one and done. Why? Remember, one of the things God is growing in us is perseverance a kind of faith that's stretched out. We ask and we keep on asking, just like Jesus instructed. I think we're supposed to be like solicitors when it comes to God's wisdom. As annoying as solicitors are, you have to admire their perseverance. I live in a neighborhood where in theory, there's no soliciting, but let me tell you, they come and they keep coming. And I have, a pest control contract, rolls of wrapping paper, and loads of magazine subscriptions to prove it. We need to be like those solicitors with God, to go and keep going, to knock and keep knocking, to ask and keep asking, because our good God wants to lavish us with wisdom. In the process, we not only discover God's wisdom as a treasure, but we discover a greater treasure, God himself. James wants us to know that how we respond to hardship matters. No matter what adversity you're facing, 
Remember that today you can begin to practice a defiant joy and ask God to lavish you with wisdom, knowing he gives generously to all without finding fault. Over the coming days through the study guide, we're gonna dive deeper into the life of James, chapter one, and what to do no matter what adversity you're facing.